what are typical questions that you can answer with your prediction with your AI? So, um, a footfall is the, is the key thing that uh, customers want. So, uh, when you run a shopping center or a commercial uh, property, you want to know how many people came in, how many went. So, footfall is the, the very basic one that we provide. And at the moment, this is done by IoT sensors, so your infrared brake beam sensors. Then you have MAC address trackers, which basically look at your mobile phone logging in and out of the Wi Fi network. Those are extremely inaccurate. And a lot of devices nowadays obviously have Wi-Fi access. So you might have one person with six or, or however many devices. Uh, also, it doesn't work on Apple. Um, and so you probably can only capture about 20% of the people uh, who come to your facility. Then there's 3D cameras, there's infrared cameras, AI cameras, so much sensor tech beacons and so forth. So we can basically replace all of that and uh, give back data on footfall movement, who went where, how long they stayed for. Uh, we're just right now teaching the algorithm to understand if people are running, walking, um, sitting down, or if they've fallen over in case of a hazard, uh, for example. Again, CCTV is normally used to look at stuff that already happened, but we can preempt um, things. Some of the predictive analytics actually already work, so uh, when objects move behind each other, um, often AI can lose track of the count. Uh, we predict their movement a little bit into the future already, so that when they re-emerge, the re-identification happens with very high accuracy. So, um, I mean, even <laughs> one of our clients basically used this technology to uh, test a fake COVID ad campaign. So they installed the camera in a bus stop, drew this line, on the pavement to see how many people go on and off the bus and another line in front of a billboard. And then the, the billboard that was displaying fake COVID advertising, fake information about the COVID, COVID uh, disease. Um, and uh, we just gave analytics about human traffic and how long people looked at, uh, if at all, at the advert. So basically a lot of the use cases come down to the imagination of the clients. But mostly it's around general kind of movement uh, statistics, data, who goes where, why, what they do. Um, some of the shopping centers we work with actually have said that, look, we don't really have that much idea who comes here at what time. So when is the concentration of teenagers highest? Uh, when is the concentration of perhaps uh, women highest? So when they come in, which shops do they go into, in which succession? Um, if a thousand people walk down the corridor, how many people turn right or left into a specific shop? And then they can look at their CRM system and see how many actually made a purchase. So then you can understand conversion rates between your main facility and each individual um, retailer as well and help them with merchandising, with supporting their ad campaigns. Um, one of the shops we work with even want to change the playlist according to who is in the shop. So I don't know if that answered your. Uh, I'm just letting this sink. <laughs> they adjust the playlist um, depending on who's, and I'm opening the floor. Like everyone who have who mm -hmm. have questions, um, chime in. I can imagine that Johan, this resonates a lot with your work. Uh, this is fantastic. I mean, I see you know these kind of applications daily uh, in my work. I mean, patents in computer vision are exploding, and I mean you know that very well. This is something I've never seen before. Um, might be a good indication for your patent application, by the way, but... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, you know, I don't want to kind of make this very technical, but I still kind of am more interested, of course, in the deep tech side. Mm -hmm. So let me put it like this. I have a space. I have a camera which has a field of view on the space. Your technology is plugged on that. So the camera provides the input, the stream, Mm -hmm. You process it, I guess, you know, that I mean, I can imagine there's a huge number of uh, various, let's say, seek convolutional neural networks, deep learning models that kind of process the, the, the images. Mm -hmm. What I, I didn't understand very well, or maybe I was um, not uh, focusing, um, what happens when you draw those lines? So uh, are those lines like linked to what type of sensor in, is in that space? 
No, so they're not linked to anything. And um, so the AI uh, is looking at pixels and how objects cross that. But, okay, uh, so, for a yeah. more detailed explanation, you probably have to, uh, I would have to have one of our PhD guys in here uh, <laughs> to explain it in, uh, uh, in, in more detail for you. No, I, I kind of understand that. So essentially mm -hmm. that line defines the, the kind of uh, region of interest. Yes, we also work with hotspots and uh, uh, polygon areas as well. So the determined behavior and um, kind of dwell time and, and metrics like that. Yeah, this is very, very interesting. Um, so and there are yeah, like we have... unlimited applications. So that's uh, one of our worries as well. Uh, so this is my little assistant here. Her name is Jessie. <laughs> so cute. Future uh, and she painted expert. the carpet. We'll find out later. <laughs> but the, one of the troubles is also around a lot of the applications. So uh, there's so much interest um, in terms of where to then put the focus. Because mm. uh, obviously you don't need the, us to come and install it. All you really need is to create the account and just start putting your camera streams in. And mm. like you saw, adding one camera stream takes less than 30 seconds to set up. And then we also help with kind of adding the line counters and uh, starting to get the data in. Uh, we do also you, are, sorry? Uh, do you like have any scientific papers on how that, like drawing the line allows the AI model to know on which region to focus and, and these kind of aspects? We're working on one uh, to be published by the end of the year, yeah. Okay, because I would be very interested on the, on the deep tech, you know, like on the, yeah, the yeah, yeah, core uh, algorithmic uh, side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm going yeah, to follow um, up on this. Can, uh, follow up later on, absolutely. So we okay. will be publishing more kind of general reading snippets of this on the blog as we get through the uh, academic research, but the paper uh, is due to be published by the end of the year. So this is in fact a private like university partnership because you said no. like PhD students or... They are, we, we, pay, we pay for them to be okay. on our payroll. So they do PhDs. Um, and um, so they, they're kind of really, they're fans of what we do. Um, so uh, they want to write about it. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. something that we support and um, enable. Hmm. Okay. Can the cameras can be any camera, can they? I mean, obviously linked, linked to the, uh, the web, but uh, other than that, they don't need to be any camera in the world, essentially. Yeah. And, and, I mean, what's really, uh, you, I can see what you mean about the challenge of identifying the opportunities to go. It's virtually limitless, isn't it? Now, do you have yeah. information on the, the growth of the cameras linked to the web? Because I presume that's very rapidly <laughs> growing as well. So well, there's, so yeah. No, there's, there's a COVID actually accelerated it. Yeah. So many cameras were installed and different types of cameras and were installed right. to monitor uh not just temperature but social distancing as well so that's yeah. something we did briefly last year uh but then the interest really only came from kind of uh power structures rather than private enterprises mm. so we didn't continue with that um but the, uh, different numbers say that they're by 2022 ldv capital markets uh, who invests a lot in uh, computer vision and ai they estimate that there will be in excess of, uh, I think it's 40 billion cameras worldwide. But those are those include embedded cameras into devices yeah. and street furniture, et cetera. Uh, the CCTV camera numbers are uh, lower. So in yeah. millions um, globally. Yeah, I'm sure it's, it must be rapidly growing as well, as you say, with coronavirus. And is it, yeah. you know, the, the, the focus you have in the technology a sort of street level or mall level is it it's not you, you see some interesting i presume that ai enabled cameras from space that that can look at climate or you know pollution or you know various other things but it's not really that that's not the market that you're you're targeting and your technology isn't really appropriate for that um we did look briefly into the space uh, side of things so i think it's quite common to try and estimate, um, looking at car parks uh, at the commercial real estate or shopping centers. So how yeah. full is the car park, how well they're doing. That's disrupted by cloud. So it depends what kind of satellite you have.
and it's really expensive to get the high resolution images. Mm -hmm. And then there are that, I don't like private constellations are not, um, I don't know how many there are in Europe. I know Finland was going to send up one last year, but I don't know if that happened or not. So it's actually very expensive to go and order the satellite to go in, into a specific space right. Mm -hmm. right now and take a picture to see what's there. Yeah. So um, we, we, we did drop that completely, but we did look into it for, for a little bit. So our use case really is what you might call the security camera angle use case. Right. Anywhere mm -hmm. you have a security or CCTV camera, that's the type of view angle our algorithms are trained on. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the types of environments that recognize. And right. again, from shop floors to factories to outdoor areas, you, you know, they're relatively on the same height. So uh, we, we really do work anywhere. So we have yeah. trained our data sets, both indoors and outdoors. Right. And one of the perks of being in Estonia is we've even trained it on snow, sleet, rain, mm -hmm. and fog, and sun, extreme sun, sun glares, uh, which we mm -hmm. get in the summer because we have 20 hours of daylight uh in june so it can it can recognize people movements cars and vehicles through those uh through those different so what happens is that the system recognizes when there's um blur or mm. fogginess on the camera lens and then we swap out the algorithm on the back end that's specifically oh. trained on foggy or blurry images um right. to maintain the accuracy rate oh. fantastic so you can use um you have access to all these cameras worldwide? Uh, we, we'd love to, <laughs> not, yet. <laughs> not yet, but we'd love to be the go-to platform uh, for all camera-based analytics. But for example, um, now if I would like to, to exhibit a new, a new car, I put it, for example, here in Barcelona, I put it on the Rambler and then I, I drew the lines and I want to know, know at what moments the public stops or like yeah. at which sides of the car they're looking at, the, at what time. So for, for this, Absolutely. you would have to ask yeah. them for, for permission. Or you would, would uh, I don't really understand. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not so technical. No, um, fine. Like how to have the... the the access um, to these uh, to the yeah to the camera systems. So in that particular case, you'd probably speak to Barcelona municipality and install okay. your own cameras, or okay. if they already have street cameras that they can make available for you, uh, you could use those. So, um, but there's possibility to set up your own temporary cameras, and then yeah, you would draw the lines, and then you would understand how many people walked past. Uh, how many men, how many women, how many children, how many adults, how long they stayed there, did they circle the car mm. or did they just walk past it? Um, so yeah, you would get all of that data. And the, we can just like, we would install here the cameras and then you, from, then you apply remotely the algorithm and all the technology. You can do it yourself, just like I showed you. So anybody in your right. team can just take the camera URL feed, put it thin, check the angle, and then start drawing the lines where you want uh, counting to happen. Or we can help right. you do that as well. Oh, wow. So there are marketing agencies that are very keen to understand mm. how much time people spend in an airport, for example. Like yeah. how many billboards did they walk past? Did they stop to look? Uh, what's the demographic and, and so forth? Mm. Very interesting. <laughs> as, you, as you say, urban planning, I'm sure. Because I, I work with a client called Aegis in France. It's a big consultancy, engineering consultancy. Mm -hmm. And they do. I mean, I, I should try to see if I can connect you because uh, that they may or may not be aware of, of what you're doing. And uh, I'm sure they'd be really interested because they, you know, they pitch massive urban planning projects to governments and municipalities. That'd be wonderful. Okay. Yeah, we have a, um, a specialist in our team that actually is dedicated just to urban planning. He's been working across the Nordic region for the past six years, helping uh, public sector uh, planners um so, so everybody understands you need to put more plants in and more you know more seats but mm -hmm. then it's around where why and having the data to back those planning permissions up as well so that's something that uh, we can help provide yeah yeah exactly and you know smart city development and all, all those things i'm sure you know you yeah absolutely opportunities with that so yeah in the uk yeah go ahead Who's responsible for the transition from rich, of, rich on data to smart on data? Because if I draw my lines and I get a lot of information, 
am mm-hmm. I able to read what I what I see, or is this something that you also help your customers understand? It's both. So it's both. So essentially, uh, some of our clients have. Uh, uh, some of our clients have their own data science teams. So they want just the raw data. We have a pretty clever uh, analytics engine on the back end as well that uh, they can just get reports out of. And then uh, there are other teams like the large um, pilot we're having right now in London, uh, where we are producing a report and helping them interpret the data as well to understand how they can better imply, apply it, use it and, and um, so forth. So it really depends on the client. Um, and again, you're right. It's There's no point having just a lot of data. Um, we have to help our clients interpret this as well. And that's something we're working um, towards. Sorry about this. She's getting overly excited. It is overly exciting. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. But it very much depends on the sophistication level of the clients in terms of have they invested in data science before or not. Yeah. What I also see here is um, an issue of, of scalability. So you have a huge number of these input uh, streams, right? How do you ma- manage on the back end, like um, to make it real time for the clients, the, the or mm-hmm. near real time, I guess. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's auto scaling in the back end. So everything's provisioned automatically um, as more and more cameras are um, added. And another thing scaling wise is actually um, some of our uh, clients uh, are really happy that it's camera based so that uh, if they work in different countries, they don't they don't um, need to install new kit because the cameras are more or less universal anywhere. And so it scales that way that you don't have to have specific IoT devices mm-hmm. per country or per supplier or vendor lock-in, anything really with uh, an RTA. Impact. It is actually cheap, yeah, because you could just get rid of all of the IoT tech you had, all the waste, the electronic waste, is thousands of and probably more of these sensors out there than there are cameras. Um, and they all aggregate the same dumb data. They aggregate footfall and really inaccurate dwell time. 3D cameras do say that they are able to provide age and gender, but again, that's, um, you know, how accurate is it or not? Um, still to be verified, they're expensive to install and calibrate. And um, AI cameras, again, expensive to install. And then you still need to process the data to get more analytics out of it than just footfall and um, object identification. So scaling wise, um, the cameras are quite handy. Do you think that the, the, the like future of cities, so, you know, of course, uh, let's take smart Dubai, you know, like one of the biggest example is about a city full of cameras. And in time, people will realize that all these other types of rather expensive IoT devices don't really provide that return on investment than like people think nowadays. So we did work with Dubai actually for two months uh, last oh. year. So Dubai invited us to collaborate with the Road and Transportation Authority. Um, last February and March, we had to leave because of COVID. Oh, uh, yeah. Like I think most of the world kind of ground to a halt and then Ramadan came straight after. So uh, what happened there was they have a lot of cameras available throughout the city. And what's happened with the sensor tech is that um, uh, so they have this loop system that's been installed inside of the pavement or the, the streets. And you know Dubai, they have rebuilt that place yep. 20 times over in the last 20 years. And a lot of the roads have been dug up, then reinstalled mm-hmm. and dug up, reinstalled. And a lot of those sensors have been damaged Mm -hmm. And they have kind of reverted back to factory settings. So you have those junctions where there's a really, really long queue and the loop system's not responding anymore because it's not been put back properly or it's broken or not calibrated well. Um, And then you would really need real-time data, even just to kind of manually 
change the traffic light or kind of help with the management of that system. Um, so just in light of that particular experience, I think it, and then they realized it as well, it would be so much easier, easier to use the existing camera network um, and just do all of the analytics based on that. Why put any more IoT stuff in the ground uh, and on lamp posts and so forth? And that's extreme weather conditions there as well. You can imagine the 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 temperature of the road surface in the middle of August um, in Dubai is very, very high. So just mm -hmm. like in Estonia, the uh, sensors won't last the promised 10 years. In February, we can have up to minus 39 degrees. They will last much less. So uh, camera-based um, analytics, in my opinion, like, um, I mean, a no-brainer. This is extremely interesting because um, some days ago, I, I uh, listened to a talk about Smart Dubai and... Um, this was like one of the main conclusions that this, the future of cities and you know all these smart applications, uh, traffic management, healthcare, um, everything you know, pollution, can be solved with cameras. So the future of smart mm -hmm. cities might actually be that most, I mean, the majority of these sensors will be uh, like traditional cameras actually on the street. Yeah. So kind of going back into that exactly uh, into the beginning. Exactly. I, I find it's very interesting. And we see, you know, in, in technology often that we start very complex and in time we realize that the same thing can be realized with very basic things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, Saudi Arabia is now building this new city. I don't know if you've heard of it called Neom. Yes. And so also that's... Egypt is building a new capital. Um, yeah, I think it, uh, Indonesia is doing the same. Yeah. So a lot of them are kind of building these new cities. Actually, Philippines, I found out today on a client call, is building uh, a new city to house um, one million inhabitants. It's a 20-year project. Um, it's a, uh, just a greenfield site right now. So uh, all of this new city building is happening. All the uh, infrastructure is going in, in terms of connectivity and so forth. So it just is a no-brainer. I guess one of the questions now comes around privacy and security. So we have made it uh, as a principal point not to work with sanctioned countries or countries that um, have perhaps dubious human rights records and so forth. As I just and then also um, we haven't taken investment from those particular countries or uh, investment funds that are associated, for mm -hmm. example, with China, with Russia and yeah. um, so forth. So we, we refused all of that money. Um, and that's the reason we have put the whole GDPR privacy safety really front and center. Because I, I wouldn't want obviously to be monitored all the time. Um, but I also think that we could make the physical environment so much better by harnessing the data about how people move, what they do, when, are there any bottlenecks? Are there any hazards? Uh, you know, are, are green spaces enough for them? Should they be bigger? So I think the technology could be used in wonderful ways. Um, just the mindfulness has to be around the uh, privacy and uh, security. And your example is very beautiful because it shows that, you know, we don't need this precise information about the people like um, who is there, but just by the age, still, you know, like very interesting applications can be imagined, like changing the music or I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the temperature or something like this, the light uh, kind of uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that, women, yeah, go yeah. ahead, sorry, Johan. I, I read recently in this kind of marketing strategies that in open spaces in companies, so it's very difficult to kind of find that temperature because men apparently need higher temperature than women, right? The other way around. Oh yeah. And the, that's actually what I was just going to mention to you that women actually okay. always feel cold and men always feel hot, and then your cognitive function is actually impaired because yes. of your working environment being in the you know with the wrong temperature. And it's a very beautiful example that you know if you identify in real time because this is real time that now it's eighty percent women, you mm -hmm. can you know just direct the temperature. Hey, get a bit you know adapted. Yep. And we can sync up with CRM systems, with the building HVAC management systems, all the data from there, and then start correlating. Okay, so what's happening in terms of outside temperature is this, this is how many people are in, this is what happened with the temperature or the AC or, or whatever. 
A really interesting one is also around driving. So obviously when it rains, people get into their cars. When it's sunny and you want to still keep a good um, revenue in your car park, how do you incentivize them to Mm-hmm. to drive yeah. for example yeah with some exactly. of our uh, retail customers we look at how many people came in per vehicle and whether people park the car and just leave so in estonia it's free parking in a in a shopping center's car park okay so a third up to you know a third of whatever of the car park might be used by people who just use the free parking um as a park and ride uh, I place. see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. So, so you're kind of taking advantage. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're underutilizing your real estate essentially. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. So I can all these use cases that kind of have popped up as we have kind of tested this tech um, and and listened to the customers start asking all these questions about can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? I'm like yes, of course. Let's 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 have a look. And I think you're a beautiful. Let's have a look. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you're also a beautiful example of what we call uh, ethical AI. So AI, which focuses on, on privacy. Thank you. Yeah, we, we hope to be that. And we would like to be the flagship uh, or the gold standard for the, uh, the GDPR compliant and safe uh, monitoring. So for example, our clients, as long as they just have a sign up paying CCTV camera or camera surveillance uh, for security reasons is being monitored here, um, that's normally enough. Um, mm-hmm. depending a little bit on the specific country's legislation. But like you asked Sarah earlier on, whether you can put the camera up. So you wouldn't even have to ask permission from people walking by because we're not looking at anything that identifies an individual. Exactly. I mean, you can, in AI, just consider it as a human, but not, you know, face recognition or yeah. gesture just recognition. Just looking at movement trend. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we've just been testing our gender detection in the past three weeks. So the accuracy went from 70% last week to 80% this week. I think it's the highest we can probably get for now, which is already very high. Um, But it's just sometimes if you can't tell with your human eye, AI will not be able to tell so either. And we have been discovering some interesting mascots and people in funky costumes walking about. So those are all categorized Mm -hmm. as other. So do you, for example, because for gender, it's quite important, the face and hair and these kind of features, uh, I guess you focus on like closing or, or the movement kind of uh, pattern. Um, and so, yeah, so how the AI makes its decision, um, I don't know, but the way we train it is probably around silhouette, uh, ah, yeah, color yeah, exactly. of clothes, yeah. mm-hmm. height, uh, we also discovered in Estonia that uh, women carry a lot of parcels under their arm. So a handbag or parcel or bag or books or something. Like women carry stuff. Uh, men just walk with two hands. Yeah, exactly. That's a, a very good point, actually. It's a good uh, kind of differentiating feature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we don't look at gait because that's already biometric. Yes, but we just yep. look at just the kind of general silhouette. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, this is another example of how to make AI ethical. I mean, make sure that you don't kind mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. I, uh, use any information which might, you know, imagine your data is, is leaked to somebody that they can identify the person. I mean, um, we don't really keep any identifiable data at all. So when I describe this to business people, I sometimes say that you should imagine the video stream like a waterfall. Mm-hmm. And we're like a sieve. The waterfall uh-huh. falls through the sieve and we only capture the little details in the water. But we actually don't keep any of the stream. We don't save any of it. It just flushes through the system. And all we keep is metadata. So we, okay. we can't, there's no way for us to go back and identify who we looked at. We, mm-hmm. we purely get out the count um, from that. I see. Yeah, yeah I see. Mm-hmm. So, and then we keep it for a month. Some clients want us to keep it for longer. So planning companies is a good example. So they want to see the trends over time. Right now, what they might be doing is using these uh, space survey surveys. So you'll have some sensor tech set up, maybe some manual counting happening. Um, and then basically that sort of um, uh, data is, is, is essentially it's old the moment it's released. So um, some of the clients have replaced um, these sorts of surveys or movement studies with continuous data gathering from their existing uh, camera tech. 
So, uh, and they want to keep the data for about um, uh, up to 10 years and more. And because of the uh, physical environment, they will know what kind of planning will happen. And they just kind of go and validate against uh, the trends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Mm -hmm. And I was interested that you mentioned the gate is is it gives biometric data, so you can you would want to collect that. I'm not quite sure if I understood correctly. What, what's the problem in gate? Um, compared the gate is unique to people. So if you have a limp or a very specific way of walking, um, that's actually considered biometric uh, data. So that's something that uh, is uh, cannot be captured. Right. So it really is unique. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's I, I guess it. I mean, it would be nice, but then again, it's uh, quite reductive in terms of um, uh, you know, um, so not all old uh, older people, you know, have a specific walk. It's mm. um, so we, we don't even just even look at it. Um, your smartwatch point. with your hand movement knows with higher accuracy that it's you than iris skin. Right. Really. Yes. I know because um, a friend of mine worked for Xiaomi. So who are me? They were producing the Mi Band for Xiaomi and their market leader in China. So they produced like, I don't know, they sell a million a month or something like that. And he said that the biometric movement of your body is the most accurate thing that you can identify to, to a person. More than fingerprint, more than iris scan. So you can wear your watch mm -hmm. and it would open your, your car. But if you would wear my watch, it wouldn't open the car for you. Okay, that's amazing. Hence, biometrics, so if you want to have gold standard, biometric data must be excluded. Okay. So interesting. Mm -hmm. I have to say that um, you're a little wonder. I mean, not only what you're doing, but also how you're juggling being mother, family life, and work with such calmness and patience. I'm in awe. Um, thank you. Thank you I meditate for... a lot. <laughs> 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 There's also a very uh, sticky dog here. I'll just show you. Her name is Chicken. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> she just won't leave my side. I think she's freaked out by the three year old child. Think a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. So, Karen, it's, it's Marcus speaking. Um, mm -hmm. If you were to bring out a crystal ball and mm -hmm. say, we were having this conversation in let's say three years time what would you be telling us about the innovations and the changes which have taken place in the last three years i think uh, one will be around the accessibility of artificial intelligence both in terms of how people perceive it and understand it so I think there's a lot of investment going into actually making people more aware of what AI is and, and to understand it. Because so far, it's still, a, for majority of people, it's the stuff of uh, sci-fi. Yeah. So I think I will, or we will hopefully have to explain less what AI is and actually be able to quick jump, quick, quickly jump into the uh, uh, benefits of what it, what it delivers. Um, also, it will be in use a lot more, and there will be jobs out there uh, that don't exist right now. So, trainers for AI, algorithm kind of, so, so like the industrial revolution, people were worried that jobs will disappear. Um, just new jobs will be created. So, there will probably be a massive package of new types of jobs that will be set up. And in terms of the space that we are working in, I think or what we can already see a little bit is this uh, learning between public and private spaces. And oddly enough, that's been accelerated by COVID. So in some European cities, the uh, city center, so basically the, the shopping center that are dotted at the moment on the periphery, uh, a lot of boutiques are moving back into city center, back into community, back into where people are actually moving. Um, and those cities and so the malls that are in the edge of the city with a massive car park and a big kind of um, metal box essentially where you go and shop. They have been uh, even looking to us actually to understand how we can create more of a public space here so that they don't just come uh, to shop but to actually spend time. So how can I 
lift the quality of my private uh, commercial space. So I think a lot of that kind of meshing and the the, the 15 minute city uh, will we will be moving towards that just because there's so much demand for it. So I think the biggest step ahead is that everything that needs a data scientist today um, will be accessible, understandable um, in a glimpse by an average human. Maybe like, not everything, but a lot more than it is no. right now. So the logical conclusion for that is that we will hopefully be in a position to better utilize our resources. So mm -hmm. the example which you gave, Karen, of people getting in a car to drive to a shed to come out to buy stuff, to put it in their car, to take it home, which sounds mm -hmm. silly. Yeah. <laughs> is that people will walk to a showroom to purchase something which then gets delivered to their home. And mm -hmm. the, uh, the ability to know that this showroom is not full will become semi-ubiquitous. So on a whatever device it has, I will end up with, I will be able to navigate to the places where I can maximize my interaction with people and minimize my waiting and messing around time. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing. I think so. I mean, one of those little things already uh, we have built in into a car parking solution. So we uh, have geo, there's a geo JSON in every specific car parking space that we track. And uh, you can mark this based on whether it's disabled, family parking, electric vehicle charging station, and so forth. So you can essentially already, um, with uh, one of our customers, it's going live quite soon. It's 1,700 car parking spaces. Um, they, uh, you can basically uh, not just go to the nearest car parking space, uh, car park, sorry, but you can actually navigate Okay, the dog's eating the jelly beans, go away. Um, you can actually <laughs> navigate into uh, a free car parking space that serves your specific need and is available for you. So if you need a, you know, like I said, EV charging station, whatever, you know that they will be ready, maybe even pre-book it, and then it reduces your waiting time and it specifically caters to your need to be able to go in and do what you need to do. But it could direct me but through my sat nav, couldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can just click on it and you, you oh, can navigate to it. Yeah, to, I don't need to book. It can just, it can yeah. start. So I become the slave to the machine. <laughs> or the slave, uh, sorry, the machine has uh, made your life so much more convenient. Yeah. Um, as perhaps somebody who needs disabled parking and then would have to wait half a day to, be able oh, absolutely. to get to one. Absolutely. So that should be going live in our case, I think in about a week or two. So do you think we'll have this explosion of the Internet of Things and the way in which they're communicating with each other and the devices we're putting around? Do you see that in the very short term or do you see that in a medium term? So, I mean, they're already communicating. It's just we don't really probably utilize the, the information properly. Um, and also, like we mentioned earlier on with Johan, um, the amount of sensors probably will be reduced. So the whole internet of things and IoT and um, some, some stuff will remain, but uh, the kind of explosion of sensor tech or IoT, I think it will be curbed uh, quite heavily in, in the coming years. And again, when I speak to some of our clients, they say, this is genius. You know, it's, why do I have to invest 150 grand getting... 20% accuracy and two metrics when all I could do is put up 300 euro cameras mm. and get so much more data. It, it just seems such a no brainer. So the IOT and the connected devices, it's uh, you, you then have to kind of extrapolate the data and analyze it still and, and so forth uh, rather than just use cameras and, um, and then let the AI do its kind of magic from those. Mm. Yeah, Can I ask, like, how many programmers you have, or how many um, no technicians who uh, who develop this data? 
basically this uh, whole uh, system was only developed by uh, three people oh, three wow. four people okay. so we but it took a while <laughs> so it took a year and a half uh to build it uh to raise the funds to be able to hire a bigger team so now we are uh, 17 people and and growing so the team is actually quite, uh, I think, relatively yeah, lean. Mm. Yeah, so the approach has been when we built the company is not to uh, have um, unnecessary overhead. So mm. anything that we have been able to hire in as a consultant uh, rather than full-time, we have done. And then when we see that, okay, now there's a need for a full-time person, we either make an offer to that particular consultant or bring somebody in, complete the knowledge transfer project, and then that full-time person kind of um, carries on. Um, the AI, uh, the artificial intelligence part that we have, we have researchers actually working on researching various ways of how to implement, how to test. Is it the uh, YOLO v4? Uh, we wrote uh, some of our stuff in Darknet, um, all kind of crazy magic stuff like that. Um, deep sort, accuracies and so forth. Um, and then there's um, the engineering team. So they're the ones who kind of have to put everything into production and, and make that kind of magic happen. So that's actually a bigger team than the AI team, oddly enough. So you cannot have uh, AI without the engineering part. Um, I did. I've just shot you a calendar invite for the session with the Kai on Friday. Mm -hmm. one of the experts in ethics and artificial intelligence. I thought that might be an interesting session for you as well. So you'd just be invited to Great. join. Great. I'd love to join. My mom's here on Friday night. So uh, uh, I will be without the, the dog and the kids. <laughs> I think it's Friday morning because it's Hong Kong. So there are six hours. We're six hours. Okay. Beyond. I'll have a look. Yeah. Um, Karen, thank you so much for taking time introducing us to what you're working on. This is amazing. I'll connect you with everyone. I feel like with Johan, at least, the, the Niall said that he has a contact for you. So we'll see where this goes. Um, mm -hmm. Kudos to your work. Kudos what you're working on. It's mind-blowing. Thank you. Because it's so simple. I love it that it's so mm -hmm. simple. It just shoot um, a signal through your AI and deliver so much valuable information. And you just show the middle finger to all the hardware technology chunk that's vomited into the the hardware into the buildings yeah basically yeah i love yeah the thank fact. you mm -hmm. i just love the fact that you are what we would call a small enterprise with audacious goals doing some interesting stuff and i'm guessing that a lot of big companies who are thinking about how do we innovate where do we go to next with twenty thousand people will just be devastated by hearing the, the sort of things which one can do with effectively a tiny, highly motivated, task-focused team. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think it's a little bit like the learning to fly bit, isn't it? Um, the two brothers who did it based on sheer passion and then the other team who never made it despite being extremely well-funded uh, and, and, you know, PR'd and so forth. Yeah. yeah, you wonder if your previous employee, were you at BT for a while? I was, I was at BT, then I was at Care Quality Commission for four years. Yeah, I, I'm thinking more about BT, with it's thousands of people, you God knows what they are not able to do. Yeah, I remember that, that was actually really an odd place to work, so we had to go out on a team lunch every Wednesday because we had to spend the budget. <laughs> And in the uh, technology group with Clive Selly's group, was it or? No, no, this was in, uh, oh God, that was quite a while ago, 15 oh, okay. years ago. So uh, it was, uh, I was part of a project that helped Edinburgh schools and uh, daycares um, oh. re-kit their entire facility. Oh. And I was working out of tele Telephony House in Gorgie in Edinburgh. Right, right, right. And I bet you wish you were still there. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> your facial expression when you described bt you went bt <laughs> yeah god it was a good learning i guess I was, I was really young i was still at glasgow uni uh but um yeah no i lived in i used to live in leith and it was just a nice couple of months uh, in edinburgh but yeah not a very different way of doing things i guess and this journey we're used to kind of getting stuff done 
quickly. Uh, this is the joint goal. Now we move towards it. Uh, we have 15 minute meetings with uh, the entire team every morning. So nobody talks more than their allotted time. Uh, anything that needs discussed offline, you take it offline. Uh, none of that kind of, um, we're very direct. So if stuff needs said, you'll say it, nobody takes offense, we move on. So I think that's why the whole startup scene has been able to explode so well. Um, and also it's a very tightly knit community. So people help each other a lot. So um, the learnings are kind of constantly passed between, uh, you know, Times of Rise guys will give sessions and Skype guys will give sessions on how they built something or how they did pricing or, um, I mean, everybody's just a phone call away. So does that mean looking where you are now, do you, do you think that some of the large, previously hugely successful organizations are sleepwalking into the future and that actually the future's in places like Estonia, and Lithuania and some of the small, the smaller countries, the smaller emerging countries, if you like, who are doing amazing things. Do you think some of the, some of I the, think the in, walking? Yeah, but the inertia of those companies cannot be underestimated and the kind of size and footprint they have. So, so they will still, I don't think they'll ever disappear, but they will definitely be challenged. Some are sleepwalking into the abyss as well. Um, also probably because of, uh, as, as victims of their success or their arrogance even. Yeah. So TransferWise is now rebranded as WISE and it's a brand. Um, the, the millennials obviously don't have brand loyalty to BT or Virgin or whoever. They'll go to whoever does the best customer service, the best price and, and best solution for them. So they don't really care who offers that. So um, I think that the landscape will change a lot, like you said, in the next three three years uh, definitely globally um, once all of these solutions kind of take off and there's less I think stigma now being an East European so that's something I felt a lot um, in the beginning and um, so that's gradually kind of slipping away now so Bolt uh, the taxi app they have been able to raise I think in excess of like 600 million dollars or something all into the Estonian entity and they have saved half a million dollars in legal fees because they have kept their HQ here. So companies, VCs are even now not saying you don't have to have a Delaware company anymore or a UK presence or a company in Berlin or wherever. It's actually completely acceptable now to be an Eastern European tech company because uh, the ones who have come before us have done really well. Interesting you say Eastern European. I would have thought that Estonia is sort of Central Europe. but <laughs> Former Soviet bloc, uh, still a lot. Uh, you know refer to us uh, as the as the east europe yeah. yeah karen we've reached the top of the hour and i want to respect your time also being a as being a mother mm -hmm. um thank you so much for taking time we we'll, we we'll see each other on friday again same rounds thank um, you so much nikki looking forward and thank you thank you once more yeah. um for time and kudos to your work Fabulous. thank you so much have a lovely thank you everyone have a lovely thank evening. You. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a nice Good night. evening. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.